steps that strides forward. 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 Hello and welcome to Strides Forward, where we share stories about running told by women. I'm Cherie Louise Turner. I'm the host and creator of Strides Forward. And in this episode, you'll hear the story of Sonia Samuels. As to not give away anything, I'm going to let the story speak for itself. But I will tell you that Sonia discovered her love of running early on in life, and she was driven by really big dreams, as you'll hear. But over time, she also experienced, like so many of us do, the downsides of burnout and pain and injury. And very fortunately, it sent her down a road of rediscovering how to run pain-free and with greater fluidity. And it reignited her passion for running, which had never really gone away, but had certainly been dampened through those rough times. An integral to Sonia's journey was her work with Jay Grunke, who's a running form specialist and Feldenkrais practitioner who works with athletes at all levels through her company, The Balanced Runner. This story you'll find is a little bit different from ones we've done in the past because it is told completely in the words of these two amazing women. So with that, I'm going to let them take it away and you'll hear from me after the story. Okay, so my name is Sonia Samuels and I live in Loughborough, which is near uh, Leicester in the UK. It was the 1992 Barcelona Olympic Games. I was 12 at the time and I remember watching Sally Gunnell, who was, she was a GB athlete and she was in the 400 metre hurdle. Gunnell leads and goes for it and she gets it right. Gunnell going for gold and Gunnell gets the gold. And she won the gold medal. And I just remember watching Sally Gunnell coming down the finishing straight and I just announced, okay, I want to be an Olympic runner. And I just remember the reaction from my family and it was sort of like, okay, yeah, okay then, Sonia, yeah. But I really meant it. I thought, I can do this. So I was like, okay, I'm going to join the local running club. And it started from there. I actually... Um, spoke to my PE teacher because I'd done a couple of school cross countries and really enjoyed it so I asked the PE teacher and they said oh yeah there's a local running club um, which was really close to my home so I actually went along on a Tuesday evening and it all went from there really. If I take a step back to my school days I was a very very shy introverted kind of girl who wouldn't speak up in class and the teachers like I had great school reports but they would always say Sonia needs to put a hand up and contribute more Sonia needs to speak up more and I don't know what it was about running it gave me I don't know gave me this confidence that I'd never felt at school or anywhere else so yeah I going through school doing the cross country, doing 1500. Then I, obviously I was getting more into the long distances because I was doing 100 meters long jump as well when I was 12. Um, But I think my real love was the longer that I run, the better that I feel. So I decided to take up steeplechase in 2004. And then, yeah, I I wasn't fantastic at that. So I decided to have a go at the 5K, the 10K. And then someone said to me, oh, have you ever thought about doing the half marathon? And by this point, I was teaching full time and I was 31. I just got married. We bought a house and I thought, no, maybe I should try it. Maybe the time is right. I'm 31. I'm not getting younger. Maybe I should try the half marathon. And then it was the Berlin half marathon in 2011, actually, in April And it was quite a warm day and I finished third, my debut half marathon in a reasonably good time, actually. And then the the organizer said, oh, do you want to come back and do the full marathon in the autumn? And I was like, whoa, 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 no, thanks. No, I don't think so. And then I walked away and my husband was was sat chatting. He's like, "Mm, I think you'd be good at the marathon. And it, it went from there. I decided then it was 2012 and the Olympic Games was coming to London the following year so I thought well maybe if I ever go you never know what could happen so it was April 2012 the qualifying race for Team GB actually ahead of the London Olympic Games that I ran my debut and absolutely loved it that's when I discovered right the marathon is for me 
And there is something about not only finishing the marathon, but actually standing on that start line thinking, right, I'm in great shape. I've done four months of work. Let's see what I can do. And you get to run with so many people on the streets of like a great city or whatever. And then when you finish it, that my first marathon, when I finished was the most emotional I've ever felt at the end of a race. I just burst into tears. I was like, I've done it. I've just run a marathon. There is something so satisfying about it that that I, I've never felt with any other distance. So I finished fourth in the trials for London 2012. So I obviously didn't make the team then. But that really spurred me on to think, well, you know what? There's another Olympics in four years' time. And then in the back of my mind, it was like, yeah, but you're going to be 37. And I was like, well, we've just got to see what happens. And anyway, in... 2015 I ran the Berlin Marathon in the September and actually ran my current PB which is 228.04 which put me in a good place to qualify for the Olympics Um, but the actual trial was the following April in London the London Marathon where I had to finish top two so I actually went to the trials with the quickest time so my job was to finish top two at the age of 37, she was the second Brit home at last month's London Marathon. Enough to make Team GB. That just sounds amazing. It's still sometimes you have to, I have to, people keep saying to me, oh, congratulations on becoming an Olympian. I'm like, oh yeah, wow. I, I still don't think it's actually sunk in yet. And then, yeah, I went to Rio in 2016, a couple of months later. Yeah, it was my Olympic Games and it was... It was actually funny because you you spend, like I said before, I spent 25 years trying to become an Olympian and you you stand on that start line and you you finish and, but then you walk away from it and you think, well, what, what do I do now? What do I do now? Like, it's the pinnacle of an athlete's career becoming an Olympian. But then afterwards, I spent a couple of months completely lost at sea thinking, I don't know what to do now. But it's not just about becoming an Olympian. For me, I really love running and it's something I'm really passionate about. And it's brought me a lot of joy, but it's also broken my heart a few times as well. You know, when you don't have that race you want to have. And I think it's like, it's almost having like a a long-term love affair with running. It's it's crazy because it's, it's great when it goes well, but it's absolutely awful when it doesn't. So yeah, it was about refocusing and finding something that I wanted to get out and train for. And I think that's that's where things changed a little bit for me post Olympics because it was almost like, okay, I put my heart and soul into it. And I was 37 coming on 38 and I almost felt physically and mentally tired. But I think that the problem with being an athlete and a professional athlete as well is that it's almost like you identify yourself as an athlete and only an athlete. Okay, right. Sonia Samuels, she's a marathon runner, Olympian. That's what she is. I almost knew like my body felt a bit broken, but my head's thinking, yeah, but yeah, but this is what you do. This is your job. You need to go training. You need to do the next marathon. And it was really difficult for me to say, no, I'm not doing this anymore. I did Commonwealth Games, which is quite a big thing for someone who lives in England. And then it rolled on to, okay, it's the Europeans the same year. And so it's like, okay, right, I can do that. And then I finish that and I think I'm feeling down again because things aren't quite going right. And it's like, oh, right, you need to set another goal, right? I'll do London next year. And it was London 2019 where I ran around that London course And it was almost like I was there physically, but mentally, I was just looking around thinking, what am I doing? What am I doing now? And I was carrying a hip injury, a foot injury, and I ran my worst ever time. And it was at that point I said to my coach, I can't do this anymore. This is, I don't enjoy it. I'm not happy. I'm trying to run fast. I can't run as fast as I used to. And I I have pain. And it was as simple as that. It was sort of, okay, what else, what else, there must be something else I can try. And he just said to me, look, he was like, you're doing the gym work, you're doing the running. He's like, 
you're you're going into the physiotherapy, you're doing the massage, you're getting beat up. He said, and you're coming out and you're still sore and you, you're still having niggles. He was like, how about trying something a little different? He's like, you're going to have to be a little bit open-minded about it. Uh, I'm going to introduce you to someone he's worked with, who would work with his wife. You can have a chat and see what you think. And so he put me in touch with Jay. Hi, my name is Jay Grunke, and I'm a Feldenkrais practitioner and running form expert. And we had a call, and we just like, I just thought, right, this is for me. I bought into it straight away. So the thing is, running is so deep for us that you can't like not get deep with this, I think. And the tremendous variety that we see in running form is a testament, I think, to how fundamental running and how important running, you know, at least was to our species in its development and also just feels still fundamental to us. Um, We can pull it off, (laughs) if need be, any number of ways. We can pull it off around injuries. We can manage it if we're pulling or pushing or carrying something. And that's beautiful. And at the same time, it's made it, it's one of the things that's made it hard to get to the bottom of, well, so then how is it, you know, like what is, what is the best running form if we're going to be aiming for something? How is it best done? You can't say perfectly because there's no sort of end at which it, is perfected, right? Somehow you could always be better, but you're meeting the needs of each step and that your nervous system is sensitive and responsive enough to tell what those needs are and has a wide enough palette of options that you can find a solution that works. And so obviously in each step, you can't be doing that consciously, right? So it's that you you have learned and developed enough skill over time that your nervous system can handle that without your conscious involvement. And then you have an option to be consciously involved and make choices, but that's the least part of it. And that as an outcome is going to look remarkably consistent from person to person unless they have a very, very different body from kind of the average, um, it's going to look remarkably consistent. And so underneath all of that, then when I'm looking at a runner and if they, if their running doesn't look sort of within the range of outcomes that I would expect to see, you know, that you see on average in a skilled runner, then, um, I know there's a problem. So the difference in thinking behind that between, Like a lot of running form work is geared at making the runner look right. And no matter what they have to do to make that happen. But I'm thinking about it the other way around. How can I help them be so responsive and so versatile that everything is initiated right? And the outcome is going to be that they look right. But the movement initiation in the nervous system, the muscles that are working, the amount of tension in the body, you know, are going to be radically different between a runner who's been trying to do form work to look right versus a runner who's been trying to develop their skill. And, you know, what I'm really, one of the, one of the many things that I've been trying to do for almost 20 years and, you know, I'm in this, I'm in this for life. (laughs) This is my mission is help people understand that running is a skill sport. So, it started off with me doing a few uh, home videos outside in the street, front on, side on, of me just doing a few short runs. And then I sent them over to Jay. So let me say first that we have this almost religious faith in video, that it shows us the truth, right? Um, but in fact, video obscures much more than it shows. Uh, by being flat, by being small, by being, you know, it's off, then it's often shot on a treadmill or just from one angle. So when I, so I'm trying to do the opposite with videos. I want them to be, you know, like a little bit sloppy in some ways. I want to see quarter angles. I want to see them stop and turn around. I'm trying to get to as if it were three-dimensional. I want to understand what kind of effort they're making when in the gait cycle they're working where is their muscle tone? What is the rhythm? 
I'm also look, I'm I'm looking for where are they working that they shouldn't be. Uh, I'm looking for what how are they fighting themselves because better running form is is always easier than worse running form. But at the beginning, my real question is not what is this runner not doing or what is this runner doing wrong, but how is this runner running? You know, what are the movements they're making to initiate it? Where are they working? And I want to understand that. And I want to kind of get a feeling for that in my own body. And then I know, you know, where our starting point is. And then we had another call and she was like, okay, right, this is what I see. So she, she basically looked at these videos and did an analysis of how I was running and was there somewhere where I was putting more stress that was causing pain? And, you know, I'd give a 10 out of 10. She like said, you're doing this and that's where you've got pain there. And I was like, okay. Because when I've gone through the process of looking at the video and looking incredibly detailed way through the history and the person's sort of physical and movement, and then also health history, because that bears on how they move in many ways, history of injuries, very careful tracing of what came first, you know, in usually the multiple injuries that any given runners had, what started off this cycle, and then how did that lead to the next thing and lead to the next thing. And then let that lets me start to rewind the process and, and gives me more insight into what does this runner need to learn that would make all the difference. And then I can begin putting stepping stones in front of that person. Starting the first stepping stone is just one step beyond where their starting point. And then just another safe step and another safe step. Because if it's not safe and if it doesn't feel safe, then the person won't adopt it. <laughs> they, they won't learn it. So that's how that process works. And she said, what I'm going to do is prescribe you a set of lessons, if you like. You're going to go away and do them for a month. You're going to redo the videos. I'm going to watch them again. Then we're going to have another chat and see if I can see anything different. So um, there are two ways to give a Feldenkrais lesson, and one is using touch, and it's just one-to-one, and the other is we call awareness through movement, and it's verbal instructions. And so that lends itself quite well to a recorded audio format. So the um, the audio instructions, that's uh, they're they're Feldenkrais lessons. And uh, I have a huge library of lessons that I've recorded for runners. So she'd set me a different lesson each week. So it was over the month, there was four different lessons and you would go away and do like an hour lesson and they were all floor based. And at first I was lying on the floor and she was telling me to move my arm this way and move my arm that way. Now, please lie on whichever side is more comfortable for you. And arrange your towels of love. And now place your arms together in front of you with your arms straight, your hands relaxed, and begin to lift your top arm towards the ceiling and perhaps towards behind you, towards the floor behind you. And now be really attentive as you begin this movement so that you only go so far as it feels really easy and you feel no stretch. And pay special attention to what you feel happen at the very beginning of the movement. Maybe even lift your arm so slightly that the top hand never really loses contact with the bottom hand. And just as you begin this movement, what is the first thing that happens? What is the first place you feel work or movement? And the first time I did it, I sat up, I was like, what am I doing? What is this? And it just seemed, and my husband was just like, what are you doing rolling around the floor? The way the lessons are done, there's a lot of structure and rigor in the lessons themselves. And not by accident do people feel like it's a little formless and like often they're rolling around on the ground, you know, and if you've watched a baby do, you know, what we could say is the hard work 
of learning how to move and fulfill their intentions, reach that toy, get across the room, whatever. That's what it looks like. <laughs> That's organic learning. Also, the lessons have a lot of feedback loops built in. So you are always assessing, you know, really your success at the goal of the lesson. Is the goal of the lesson to be able to lift your arm off the floor from in front of you when you're lying on your side and get it all the way to the floor behind you without any effort or feeling any stretching sensation. And then, you know, we're slowly building the pieces of what the, your whole body has to do to accomplish that, uh, clarifying which muscle activation or which movements might actually interfere with that goal so that you can make a choice not to do them. And measuring throughout, have, has it gotten better? Is this easier now or did it just get harder? She was like, how does it feel to you? It was a, a lot of her actually putting it to me. What can I feel? And so all your discoveries are your own. It's only from the learning experience where you are yourself so measuring your own movement and getting feedback from your own body, then you make your own discoveries. But it's my job to set that up so that the discoveries are relevant to what you what would make your running better. And, you know, again, a, a series of safe steps. So, but when, when you're lying down on the floor doing the lesson, you don't experience any of that structure. You're just following instructions, exploring, feeling sometimes baffled. Uh, <laughs> because, because if you're not in unknown territory, you're not actually learning anything new. So first we have to get you into a situation where you can feel what you're doing. So I thought, right, okay, I really need to, to tune into this. And I put my headphones on, lay on the floor, completely quiet, shut all the curtains. And it sort of clicked. It was like, okay. And uh, according to something called the Weber-Fechner theorem, you can only feel a change in a stimulus of about a 40th the size of the stimulus, right? So if you are standing outside on a bright sunny day and you light a candle, you don't notice any increase of light. It's not any brighter outside. But if you're standing in a dark room and you light a candle, it makes a huge increase in the amount of light and the amount that you can see. So in running, you've got a you've got a lot of strong sensations when you run, you've got the impact and the effort and all of that. And that drowns out all the tiny things. That's like your bright sunny day. But if you come indoors, you lie down on the ground, you take out the impact, you take out the muscular effort, then you can feel tiny changes. And those tiny changes are often the trail of breadcrumbs that leads you to a whole new way of moving. So you need to be able to feel those sensations. So that's why we don't do this work outdoors when you're running. You run a little before the lesson, you run a little after the lesson so that you have a compare and contrast. What difference did the lesson make to your running? And so that you can connect what you learned about yourself to your running. You have a really clear carry through to your running. And the more runs you did, the more you went out and practiced feeling these movements and feeling that it felt good. It felt good to run like that. And after the first month, I was definitely feeling a difference in just because I had a lot of hip problems, a lot of foot problems, uh, lower back problems. So we have a, a map of our bodies in our brain, just in general, uh, is called the homunculus. Um, or cortical map, and you weren't born with it. You developed it, especially through the very rich period in childhood where you're exploring and you're playing and you're experimenting. You know, the intense work that a baby does to figure out how to roll over, to sit up, to creep, to crawl, to stand, to walk. And um, you were building your map, like an explorer develops a map. And all your subsequent life experiences also affect that map. The repetitive things that you do, the things you stop doing, especially once you're in school and at work and sitting all the time, and especially the things that cause you pain, which significantly and rapidly 
change your map. And the only way to replace things that vanished from the map and to correct mistakes that might be on the map is through that same process of exploration that you did to create the map to begin with. And (laughs) when a runner wants to run better, mostly they need to learn how to stop getting in the way. And a lot of what's involved in that is having just a completely incorrect um, map that they're working with about what they have to move and how it can move for doing all of this. And so that's what approaching running form this way allows you to work on. And it's why you can get sometimes really rapid, dramatic results. And every runner can, you know, has a lesson or two that they do where like the world has changed by the time they've finished the lesson. They learned something that was really, they corrected something that was really wrong. They learned something that was really new about how they're coordinated. Just by improving the map that they're bringing to that project, the gate changes and improves significantly. And I think there's this misconception that as an elite athlete, you have to have a six pack and you have to be, you have this amazing core, but actually it's stopping you moving in a way that's good for running. And this is video number eight in the Stuck at Home running tip series. So you may have been trying to hold your pelvis still because a lot of people do because of that term core stability which means different things to different people. It means different things in a clinical setting, but it is commonly taken to mean core held still, which is not ever what a runner wants. Um, and again, So I think that first month was about me getting a bit more movement around that core. And I remember Jay saying to me, like, you know, you don't have to have this really, really strong ab six pack. She said, just let it hang. And I was like, let it hang? Most of the things that any runner needs to do to improve their running form is figure out how to stop getting in the way because our structures, we evolved to be able to run. And um, so running better is usually not a matter of doing more, but actually just getting out of the way, doing less, getting out of the way. So I tried it and it's amazing what movement you get through your pelvis and your your arms moving that you think, actually, this feels nice. So we went back after a month and she was like, how does it feel to you? How do you feel you're running? And do I feel different here? And then she'd say, this is what I can see. Like I have a little list (laughs) and mostly that little list is for other people to use. It's not necessarily what I think about, but I do want to see these as outcomes. I want to see that a runner ultimately can lean forward easily, that they initiate running by swaying forward and they stop by swaying upright again or backwards, depending on how fast they were running and how fast they want to stop. Um, I want to see obviously symmetrical movement. I want to see that they're landing with a supple leg, that the ankle is directly vertically underneath the hip joint at mid stance. I want to see that their core is moving, that the pelvis is moving, that the rib cage is moving in this counter rotation motion. So it's not that we're trying to f- freeze the trunk and just run with our limbs, which is a horrible way to run. And I want to see that in the forward lean that their head is still vertical and they're leading the way forward with their face not in a way that rounds the back, but, you know, if you let your whole body lean forward, then your back is straight, like all your normal spinal curves are there, but your head is, your chin is farther from your throat than it would be if you stood upright. So I call that face forward. And I want to see that the arm swing is variable depending on the running situation. Are you accelerating? Are you, you know, running slowly or fast? Arm technique changes, but I want to, in general, see that your hands are staying close to your chest. They're coming around to your heart. They're swinging more or less along the line of your ribs. Uh, you're not squeezing your elbows in. They're just sticking out the, na- the way they naturally need to do if you're going to keep your hands close to you. And that the swing is pretty compact. 
That's my list that I want to see is outcomes, you know? And so then really, I only refer to that later on, um, you know, in month two or month three of working together. I'm, you know, if any of those things hasn't happened, then I'm noticing it and troubleshooting it. So that doesn't come naturally straight away. But over time, if you practice running in this way, it starts to feel normal. So then it becomes normal. And the more you're running like this, the better it is for your body. So that's when the pain starts to ease. So like it it did take a few months for things to actually feel a lot different pain wise, but it did come. It, It just, it just came when I felt like I was moving in a better way, every run consistently. So I think it's just that repetitiveness and almost relaxing and not forcing it. Because I think some of those days where I was just like, right, okay, but what am I supposed to feel? I don't quite understand. And I think if you just try and let it come to you, it works better. There were days and there were certain lessons that I, and one of them was seesaw breathing. And it was about expanding your chest and taking your stomach in, your navel in, but then expanding your navel and bringing your chest up and I was lying on the floor and I got so frustrated I was like I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing like what is this yeah well you know I think you know as adults we bring this social burden and a tremendous amount of conditioning and expectation you know from the way we handle education you know all of the shoulds that fortunately a baby does not bring to this project right? A baby is just looking for outcomes. But I'm sure never asks itself, is this what I'm supposed to be feeling? (laughs) So we can't undo our adulthood completely and um, make it like we don't have that burden, especially because there's a strong drive towards this end goal to be able to run comfortably, to be able to run healthy, to be able to run, you know, for the rest of my life, to be able to make it to the starting line of my Ironman, to be able, you know, whatever the specific is. Well, so there's that aspect and that that's part of what makes it hard for us. You know, it, it's a funny thing where the movements, like a Feldenkrais lesson should always be done again because of the Weber-Fechner thing. It always should be done without any noticeable sense of muscular effort. And so that's like already, that feels like, what is this? Like I know somebody who calls this like the soft stuff that like power athletes don't want to do or whatever, you know, won't take seriously, you know, and endurance athletes the same is like, this is so the opposite of everything you do in training, every idea that you have about what's going to make you better as an athlete. But at the same time, it's in, in his own way, it's even harder than anything else you probably do because you need to set aside the shoulds. You need to um, stop efforting. <laughs> You need to set aside even the goal, your ultimate goal, you need to set it completely aside and um, instead notice what you feel. We actually worked together for eight months on a lot of different lessons and we sort of worked through my whole body and And it was very much a progression over a a long time, just watching things change um, to the point where I was running pain-free. And I was actually thinking, do you know what? I can go out for a run here. And I'd look at my watch and I'm thinking, actually, I didn't realise I was running as quick as that. Because, Because I was moving better, I was actually running quicker as well. Which, yeah, I think... The problem before Jay was that I'd got to the point where I was so focused on the watch and trying to hit these splits and the more I wasn't hitting the splits the harder I was trying and the more I was forcing it and the more my body felt broken to the point where I didn't want to run anymore Um, and I think it was almost about learning to run in a way that felt nice again is the best way I can put it the process of improving your movement and engaging in skilled movement and really of true athleticism 
is like a ballroom dance. Two partners dancing together. One is the leader and one is the follower. And the part of you that is the leader is actually subconscious. And the conscious part of you is the follower. And the follower is active. The follower is feeling and sensing and noticing what's happening. Is not being dragged around the dance floor, but is fully participating with the impulses generated by the leader. But things go awry if the follower tries to lead or if the follower fails to follow, right? And so this again is the opposite of how we tend to think about it. But when you can have that experience, and that's what Sonia was doing in those runs, not trying to consciously lead her gait, but to actively participate in following. And it is finding that movement pattern that feels nice running and not fighting your body like, right, I've got to move my arms quicker and and it's really difficult because you always think of these, you know, if I run more and I, I try and run faster, that it's, you're going to get the results you want. But like you say, sometimes it's almost detrimental and it's being more mindful about running. Yeah. So, I mean, part of what was, what goes on with that is that a lot of runners get confused between running harder and running faster. And the only way to run faster that most people have is to run the same way (laughs) that they run slow, but just harder, right? And your effort level goes up. And so you're judging your speed from your effort level plus your watch. And when you get better and better at getting out of the way at having a really responsive and versatile nervous system that can then you form changes when speed changes to run faster is to run differently. And then to stop fighting yourself is for the same level of effort. You'll actually be running faster anyway. And when you look at your watch later, you're shocked at how fast you're running because it just didn't feel like it because you're so used to gauging effort to gauge how fast you're running. Right. Uh, So a lot of, what she experienced with that is for those reasons. Then there's also this, you know, and, and I'll be honest, this really frightens me that we are losing any notion of our, our true capabilities as human beings, as technology comes more and more into our lives. And the the more that the technology comes in and it comes in so early in a person's process of becoming a runner that they never learn to gauge their own body. Our ancestors wouldn't have survived if they didn't have this ability and incredibly rich and resonant detail. And it is absolutely available to us. But I think more and more tech companies that have so much to gain from persuading of this make us feel like our only path forward to be to exceed the limitations that we experience and even to interact with our own bodies and to perform physically is mediated by technology and um it is a terrible theft and so um every runner should be able to and happy to leave their watch at home and see i know that a lot of the best coaches feel the same way, you know, and, you know, when I say that I know a lot of great coaches who feel the same way about runners dependence on sports watches, you know, I would just go on to say, you know, what those coaches say as well is that runners need to be able to run by feel. And it's not that you can't have the watch for confirmation or as a training tool, you know, that's also useful. But if you're dependent upon that, if that's the only dial on your dashboard and you can't run by feel, you can't judge your pace by sensation, then you're really hampered as an athlete. I also know that every runner has at least once in their life, in childhood or at some point even in recent years or even just in a dream, 
uh, had the experience of feeling smooth and flowing and like they could just run forever. And there is no technology now that will ever get you there. And so you have to step back and ask yourself, you know, first, what do I, like, why am I running? What do I really want here? And this applies to the super shoes too. And I'm not saying you can't use technology and it's not even like fun, but if, if it's central, if it determines your experience, why are you running? Like, does that really satisfy the goal? Or if you're honest with yourself, is there a deeper reason that you're running and is the, does the tech really get you there? Does the tech really give you that feeling of freedom and fluidity and rightness of being the human animal that you are? Yeah, so actually the only reason I stopped working with Jay was because I found out I was pregnant um, after those eight months. That was a good point actually, just to take time to recover properly. So I was running three times a week. Um, I didn't do any gym. Um, I did a lot of yoga. Some of the Feldenkrais uh, lessons I did as well. Because obviously I did those eight months, I still have all the lessons. So I can dip into those lessons as and well I, when I feel like it, just to refresh my memory on things and refresh how things should feel. Because I do have a tendency to get a very tight hip or lower back if I'm not doing any any other movement exercise like yoga or Feldenkrais, just to get things moving in a way that it should move. So it's very much a bit of jogging a bit of rolling around the floor, yoga, things like that. And then um, I decided after Faith arrived that I would take a very slow approach to getting back to running. So I checked in with um, a physiotherapist after four months just to check that everything was healing well and I was good to go and start running again. And then when I started to get back running, I I found that... I was actually running pretty, pretty well. And I thought, well, maybe I should have a go at racing. So I, it was about when Faith was about seven months old, I actually did my first 10K race and I actually ran really well and won. And I was like, okay, right. And um, I actually raced the 10K um, a couple of days ago and I was 10 seconds off my official 10K PB that I ran in 2014. So I'm at the moment, things are very, I'm not sure. I, do you know, I run once a day, um, six days a week. I do half the mileage that I used to do as a pro athlete. And I have a one-year-old to look after and I'm running probably just as well as I've ever ran, even over the shorter distances. So I'm not sure where this is going. But I, do you know, one thing I'd love to do is to do a marathon because my last marathon was so awful. I don't really want to walk away from marathon running as that is my last experience. So maybe I might enter a marathon and make my peace with it. Cross that finish line. Fingers crossed I make it. And okay, I'm done. That would be nice. But do you know what? I I love running so much that even though I'm not a pro athlete or whatever anymore, like I still love to get out and it's still a huge part of my life. So I think, I think the key as well is that I definitely found my love for running again, working with Jay. And I think that really shows now that it's something that I love to do and I'm actually running well from it. And I don't, again, I don't have that pressure to race, to hit splits it's just my time away from being a mum. And it's it's actually been really good for me. Ah, I just love that story. And I am so thankful to both Sonia and Jay for coming on the podcast and sharing their knowledge and their experiences. It was a complete pleasure to speak to both of them and have them on the podcast And I'm really excited to see what Sonia does with her running going forward. 
racing, being part of the running community, helping other runners. And you can join me in following Sonia. She has a very beautiful Instagram feed, and her handle is Sonia J. Samuels. And she also has a website, soniasamuels.com. And I was also very excited to have Jay on the show. I have been familiar with her work for quite some time. I've done many of her Feldenkrais audio lessons, and I have watched many of her YouTube videos. I uh, was quite a fan of a series that she did at the beginning of the pandemic, the Stuck at Home series. And she was creating videos pretty much every day. And they were tips on running form. And they're all very helpful. I, I really recommend those. And and you can learn more about Jay and all the work that she does. She also has a blog on her website. You can find that at balancedrunner.com. And you can find the YouTube channel by just looking up The Balanced Runner. And thank you for listening. As always, we love sharing these stories, but we truly could not do it without you. And if you enjoyed this, please hit the subscribe button and please share the podcast with your friends. Uh, Word of mouth is how we grow, and I would love to have the podcast grow more. I really appreciate your efforts sharing and recommending the show to other people. And I also welcome you to visit our website, stridesforwardpodcast.com. And we are active on social media, on Instagram and Twitter, at Strides Forward. It's our handle in both places. Also to know is that I do not make this show by myself. Cormac O'Regan does all the original music, and he does sound design. And he does that from his studio in Cork, Ireland. April Mariner of Bonfire Collaborative does all the design work for the show, including the website, merch, logo, and all the social media. All the stuff that looks good, that is. The stuff from way back when, that was me. And that's why April is doing it now. And April comes to you from Truckee, California, and you can find April at bonfirecollaborative.com. And yes, I am Cherie Louise Turner, and I am coming to you from my closet in Somerville, Massachusetts, Thank you so much again for listening, and until next time, we all wish you many healthy, joyful strides forward. Whoops, that strides forward. 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 Hear Her Sports is a podcast for everyone who loves stories by and about women striving to improve and make a difference in their lives. I am your host, Elizabeth Emery, a former professional cyclist. In every episode, I introduce a female athlete or woman in the business of sport through a thoughtful conversation about who they are and the terrific work they're doing. My guests and I explore the glorious and frustrating issues in sports, history, equity, training, nutrition, and so much more. Join us for inspiration, for community, and for love of being a strong athletic woman.